In this segment, I'm going to build a radio TNC called the TNC-X by Coastal Chipworks. Now, I asked Coastal Chipworks if they'd be willing to send me one of these inexpensive TNC kits out of the kindness of their hearts. Now, they promptly ignored me. Hmm, I'm not surprised. Now, MetaGeek noticed that we did some really cool stuff with 2.4 gigahertz, and, uh, and without even us even asking, they rewarded us with some of their products, which was very nice of them. It's kudos to MetaGeek. Now, Coastal Chipworks, you have to go through the gauntlet. That is BSOD. So, anyway, what is a TNC, a terminal node controller? A TNC is a device that you hook up to your ham radio, whether it be a handheld or a base station, whatever it may be. So you can do digital mode. Now, some of the digital modes you can do is things like, oh, radio BBS. Now, right here, I have an MFJ radio BBS, and we'll, if this TNC kit works, I'll showcase this in the next episode. If this TNC kit does not work out, you have Coastal Chipworks to blame for not covering the radio BBS. But, essentially a radio BBS is just like the BBS's back in the day was before broadband and, you know, instant on and cell phone based internet and you have internet everywhere you go, uh, you'd have a computer and a modem that would plug into a telephone line and you'd call a computer in which you would leave messages and files for people. Like, you'd, we'd have forums today just minus the broadband. Yes, it was slow. It was primitive. The technology was somewhat difficult to work with. Not really. But, it was a much better time. It was a much simpler time. And people use their technology for the sake of communicating viable topics and ideas. So, the TNC is a device that allows you to hook up to your ham radio so you can do digital transmissions, meaning you can send data, not just voice. And that's something that a lot of people are confused about ham radio, that you can only talk. There are digital modes. If this is the first segment you're seeing about ham radio, I'd highly encourage you to go back a few episodes and check out some of the other radio topics that we've covered amongst scanners and Wi-Fi and 2.4 gig and even the introduction to ham radio segments. But anyway, let's go to the table side and start building this kit. Okay, well, right out of the box we notice that there is a printed circuit board. All of this is through hole soldering, so even if you're a novice when it comes to soldering, this should be relatively easy for you. We have an assembly instructions and operating tips guide. Um, I've also printed this out myself in a larger format. And we've got two bags of components. The clear plastic bag are all your regular components. These are not very sensitive, but the silver bag, if you're not aware, which you must read the nice big attention labels, these are static sensitive components. So try not to handle these too much and try to make sure that there's not an excessive amount of static electricity, otherwise you might blow out these components. The first thing you really should do is RTFM. Read the fucking manual, in fact, read it twice. Go through the assembly tips and the instructions. First thing that you should do is go through your parts list, make sure all your components are there. I've already done this. This is plus one for Coastal Chips, uh, Coastal Chipworks. Everything was there as it was supposed to. There are no duplicate parts, so make sure you get this right the first time. I've also suggest getting a couple of highlighters. That way you can highlight your instructions. So as you're going through your manual, you can highlight the current step that you're up to so you don't get lost, and then use the secondary color to indicate that you have completed it. And without using, say, black or a dark blue, if you forget a step, make a mistake through a step, you can still see the printed guide underneath it so you know to go back and check your work. All right, so I've got a desk vise here so we can get some nice close-up close shots. Let's go ahead and reframe up fire up the iron and get this thing going. Everything in the manual tells you, if you don't understand the color coding of resistors, they will tell you what the, the name on the bands actually are. So I've laid everything out according to component type, you know, headers and resistors, capacitors, and I've left all of the microcontrollers and whatnot uh, for last. My soldering iron's heating up. Let's get a quick close-up of the main board. Here we have the main board. You can notice that here's going to be the header for the serial port. We're going to have a couple of chips here, here, and here. We're going to have a couple of frequency crystals here and here. And we're going to have got a bunch of capacitors and whatnot. Study the board. Everything on the board is labeled. It tells you exactly where your connectors go, where your chips go, what number your resistors are, where your uh, potentiometers go, where your crystals go, where the power jack goes. It tells you where everything on the board goes. So, study the board for a little while. Study the schematic. Even if you don't understand it, just look it over so you memorize where certain things go and how the layout is going to go out on the board. Try to make a mental map of where everything is. Now, there is one surface mount chip right here. This is uh, some FRAM, pretty much just system RAM, that was already soldered on there when we got the board. So, we don't have to worry about any surface mount soldering whatsoever. 
uh, basic soldering, uh, uh, soldering rules and materials and tools apply. Uh, all right, the soldering iron should be hot enough. Let's get started. The first step in the manual is to install resistors, well, the flat components, and here's resistors one, two, and three. So here's one, two, and three. And if you notice on the board level, they're laying really flat, and they're not falling out because when I installed them, if you notice the legs to these, I bent them outwards. That way, they hold themselves against the board. So continue installing the components as instructed in the manual with the resistors and the flat diodes and whatnot. And uh, that's pretty much the only tip I have. Just some components are electrolytic, meaning certain capacitors and diodes and LEDs, you can only use them one way. Resistors are non-electrolytic, so there's no way that you can put them in backwards. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just get to soldering these in. I am currently using a standard 30 watt soldering iron. And if this is your first electronic project in general, uh, this shouldn't be too hard, but some previous soldering experience is ideal. And it's really not, don't know what, much more to say about it. This would normally take me about 15, 20 minutes to do, but it's going to probably take me closer to an hour because I've got to do it all on tape. Okay, so there's resistors one, two, and three, and we'll just come in and snip the legs off. And if you don't know how to solder, I would recommend going back to previous BSD episodes and catch the tutorials on how to solder. I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of the uh, components in and we'll go to the next step. One thing to look out for is if you notice that the diodes, notice the polarity, there's a little stripe right here. Okay, The diodes themselves also have a stripe on them to, den to denote which way they need to be Put in. If you notice that the diode has a stripe on it, and the PCB has the stripe on it, that striped side of the diode needs to be fed into the striped side of the circuit schematic. Be really, really weary when placing your diodes in correctly, because diodes are one-way gates for electricity. They will allow electricity to flow one way and not the other. So, be extremely careful not to put these in backwards. If your LEDs are put in backwards, they simply won't work. If you place your diodes that are feeding power into the board in backwards, then of course the board will have absolutely no power. So, you've been forewarned. Well, here we go. We've got the diode, all the resistors in place, and the potentiometers. When dealing with the potentiometers, of course, you can also bend the pins on the opposite side of the board so you can solder it in a little bit easier and they'll grip into the board. Try to get all your, your components as flat to the board as possible, just to keep it nice and neat and tidy. Just remember, Polarization of your, your diode is extremely important. Don't get this wrong. If this is in backwards, then the device will not get any power, it won't turn on, and it'll be a complete and utter failure. When it's time to dip into the static bag and grab the, uh, grab the, the oscillators, the crystals, there's going to be two of them. One of them is 3.57 megahertz, which is going to be labeled A035, and the other one's going to be 20 megahertz, that's labeled A200. Do not put these into the wrong sockets, the system will not work if they're installed incorrectly. They are non-polarized, so you can't plug them in backwards. You can only put it in the wrong places. Here's another board update for you. We got all the capacitors and whatnot soldered in. Now they are a little bit hard on, hard to find on the board, but try to memorize the board and where everything's laid out. A lot of the time, the numbers are like right here is 16, uh, 16, 17, 20. Where's 18? 18's there, 19's there. The numbers are usually within the general vicinity. Now. Um, when you're soldering these in, make sure you try to get them close to the board. They do have a tendency of like to falling out a bit. So you might want to solder in one leg and then tug on the other side that's still dangling about and try to make sure that it's nice and snug up against the board. Now we have to go ahead and we've got a bit more to solder in. We've got to go ahead and do the, the chips. We're going to put in some headers, or sorry, some, some sockets. We've got some headers to put in. Uh, we still got a couple more capacitors and we're almost done. So let's get to it. When installing the sockets, notice how that there's a little notch indentation on the printed circuit board, and there's also a notch indentation on the socket itself. When you place the socket inside of the, the PCB board, make sure that that notch indentation is facing the right way. This is going to show you where pin 1 and the head of the chip is. Now, whenever you're going to solder this, go ahead and solder it, but solder the two diagonal facing pins. So in this case, I would solder 
this leg and then this leg. That way if the chip, if the, uh, the chip or if the socket isn't flush against the board, you can just reheat one of the diagonal pins, put a little bit of pressure on it, and then continue uh, soldering the rest of the pins in. There we go. We got one down and we've got three more to go. Where's those solder points so you can see? Uh, there they are, solder points right here. If you notice pad C1 here, this is a polarized capacitor, this capacitor right here, which means it can only be put in one way. You'll notice that there's a stripe on the capacitor. This denotes the negative side. The longer lead on the capacitor itself denotes the positive pin. Make sure that you put the positive leg into the positive hole on the PCB like so. If you get this in backwards, the capacitor may pop or the unit may not function properly. There will be two components in a TO95 package format, these little guys right here. One of them is a transistor that will be labeled PN2N2222, or just 2222, and the other one is going to be your voltage regulator. The voltage regulator is going to serve as like a little mini power supply. This will allow you to plug in anywhere from 8 to 15 volts into the unit and allow you to, uh, it will supply the unit 5 volts across the entire system. Do not confuse these. You can easily confuse them. If you can't read them, get a magnifying glass to read them, or find someone with good enough eyes to make sure you're not plugging the right part into the wrong spot. Notice the component placement right here on the board has an outline of the transistor itself. Follow this outline to install the transistor properly. Now, looking over here where the regulator needs to plug in, there's going to be a white bar. This is where the flat back of the voltage regulator will need to be installed. Do not put these in backwards. Here we have the board finally completed, although the chips are not in yet. We've got the headers put in, we've got the serial port, the power. The LED legs I've left a really long, primarily because later on I'm thinking about pulling them out and putting in jumper headers instead. You know, like you find in a typical computer, that way I can mount this inside maybe a, a floppy uh, a floppy bay of a computer or, I don't know, something small, handheld. Um, now there's also the receive audio, transmit audio, and PTT uh, headers on here. I'm going to put some headers on there for later so I can hook up the appropriate jacks for transmit and receive audio as well as push to talk. Now, before I power this up, the instructions say if you have a multimeter to test certain points. I'm going to go ahead and do this off frame before putting the chips in. But I do want to cut frame real quick and explain how to put the chips in. Here is one of the sockets on the board. And if you notice earlier, I mentioned that there's a little U-shaped half circle notch on all of, the, uh, all of the sockets. Well, it just so happens that the chips as well have that little notch. Come here, you little bastard. Have that little notch as well. I'm trying to get it on frame so you can see it. You see that little notch right there in the front? That indicates the front of the, front of the chip. You also notice there's a, a small little dot in front of one of the legs. You see that dot right there? That dot indicates that this is pin one. And normally this would just push directly into the socket like so. Now that little notch right here indicates that that's the head of the chip and this little dot here indicates that it's pin one. Now whenever you're dealing with these sockets, these are dip packages, dual inline package. They are extremely common with projects like this. And when you kind of push them into the socket, they'll grip in. And when you want to remove them, don't just bend outward and sideways like that. You're going to bend a lot of the pins. Try to pull them out completely straight. Eyeglass screwdriver on one side to pop the front end. Eyeglass screwdriver on the ass to, to loosen it up. And pull it out with your hand. Uh, keep in mind that some chips are static sensitive, so try not to handle them too much. All right, I'm going to go off camera, test the rest of this circuit, make sure that it works, and then we're going to finish this up on the computer side. All right, so we've got the TNC built. We've got our USB to serial adapter uh, plugged in. We've got our power. Made sure that we have a pro a pro an appropriate adapter. Uh, this is our push to talk lead. This is what's gonna hit the uh, transmit button on our radio. Here's our receive audio line. This is where we're gonna take the audio from our radio and uh, turn it into data. And right here we have the transmit lines, which I have hooked up to my computer right now. Now you need to go and set res resistor R12, which is the potentiometer right here. And you can hear that carrier tone just came up. Now this is going to be the carrier tone that, that your radio, that radio is listens, listens for. Now we're going to go and set a couple of uh, KISS frames. And we're going to transmit. And uh, the software is set up 9600 baud, COM port 5 is according to the settings of the TNC on the jumper settings. And now we can hear, according to the audio level on R12, 
kiss frames going by, so we know the unit's working, it's transmitting data, and everything's going fine. Now, if you notice, every time, every time I press transmit, the yellow LED here lights up, signifying that push-to-talk is being held and data is being, being received. Now, it is okay every once in a while that DCD, this green LED, or whatever color you decide to make these, DCD LED like flashes every once in a while. I mean, it happens. Okay, I'm going to turn this audio level down so I can finish this up. Okay, so next thing we'd have to do is set resistor R13, which is our transmit receive delay. Uh, typically, 25 milliseconds is ideal, but some radios, radios will require more. This is pretty much the amount of time that the unit's going to wait before transmitting and receiving or keying up and keying down. So, uh, the only way to really deal with that is by hooking it up to your radio and see what the tolerances are. Now, there are some discrepancies, and I did have a few minor issues when it, with this unit. There really wasn't something that I'd have to say, don't buy this. I think that this was a relatively easy project. But check the show notes, and I'll put more information about uh, the build process and some of the minor complications that I had, especially when it came to desoldering certain things because I put them in the wrong locations, uh, as well as a couple of extra tips and tricks on, on putting this together and interfacing this into your radio, whether it be ham or FRS. Okay, so, because this works, next episode, Radio BBS.